that's the star. <laughs> so, yeah, with Hammer, like, mm. straight off with Hammer, like, the connection, I think, overall from everyone, was very strong with that character. And uh, mm. I think by episode two, everyone was absolutely in love with yeah. what Especially they brought to the like, table. Oh. So i got to ask you, was that on the yeah. page? Was that on the script? Like, his character, the way that you guys kind of came to working out, you know, being the lovable curmudgeon as such? Was that something you guys developed over time? No, that was very much on the page. I mean, here we are in the middle of a writer's strike, so I, I'm gonna I'm going to get or the start of one. It's not even the middle yet. It's just started mm -hmm. today. But um, I, I think it's all love to the writers and the creators of that. They when I was in the casting process for it, uh, Henry Alonso Myers said straight up, like we are creating a character that. <laughs> I mean, at that point, I think they were well into the the writing of it they said we're we're developing a fan favorite we want to write something that is you know he's a bit crusty on the outside and then we're gonna get to the soft gooey nougat center by the end and then we're gonna lose him and they had a really hard time writing that ending because the writers themselves fell in love with him oh. um and uh yeah, from the the first the scene that I auditioned with was the scene with Uhura, you know, chopping carrots or whatever I'm cutting oh. up in there. So that was the scene that I had read, and it was very much a um, you know he's a bit of a hazing with Spock and the, you know pretending to be offended when he's really not and mm -hmm. all of that, and then kind of ends with I like her and and that sort of you know archetypal kind of crusty mentor figure that actually has a soft center. I mean that was. That's right there on the page. Um, yeah. And it's and, such a great scene, isn't it? Because it, yeah. it gives you everything yeah. you need to know about that character is pretty well captured in that scene. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of... And I think so clever when they wrote that because you would talk about, you know, getting people on board with connecting with the cast. It's just such a smart team to do that. And I will yeah. say with Star Trek, I feel this is the first show where... I've felt it took a while for me to fall in like even the next generation. Yeah, it's a couple of rocky seasons there before you're falling in love with everyone. But Strange New Worlds, instantly. boom, straight out of the yeah. gate, you're instantly mm -hmm. smitten by these actors. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful so, chemistry. Yeah. Was True. Star Trek a big part of your life growing up? Was it a heavy? Oh, energy? huge, huge really? part of it. Yeah, my dad was uh, like, he was a, a high school English teacher and a drama teacher. Uh, but he he took I think when I was like three years old or something he took his a year off to get his to take a sabbatical to write his master's degree and his master's thesis was on creating a course in science fiction for high school kids. Oh, cool! So and he was a comic cool book there. collector as well. So oh. he started collecting comics when he was a teenager. You know, he's got that classic story of going away to college and when he came home, his mom had thrown all of his comic books oh. out. No, and he had you know detective whatever and action comics number one and all that. But growing up, I I was introduced to to uh, comic books and and through and Star Trek through my dad who just loved it and so it was Sunday nights who'd gather the family around and watch uh, reruns of the the old classic series and then when Next Generation came out it was yeah it was just a celebration of the old, the old classic Trek and also the new stuff that they were able to do and the great stories that they were telling so it was very much a part of my growing up science fiction also uh, about an hour and a half outside of my hometown of Calgary, Alberta, is a town called Vulcan, where, <laughs> where there <laughs> there is a Vulcan, Alberta. There's actually a Star Trek convention. I think they're, they've got their 30 years now. Uh, this summer is coming up is Vulcan, and uh, I will be attending that, which oh, I'm very excited about. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a huge part of uh, of my life, and uh, yeah, sort of get get to step onto the bridge was like what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly yeah. steeped in a nerd heritage by the sounds of it. Like, True, I have it's yeah, I've got nerd genes. <laughs> Twenty three and geek. Yeah. <laughs> that I've got to you've kind of mentioned it and that's what fascinates me about like the show and we, when we get to talk to performers in the show um, is that moment of stepping on set for the first mm. time like and and it must be a rush because you're nervous as it is I'd assume it's your first day on set you're thinking I've got to hit my marks I've got to give a good oh my god and then you're surrounded <laughs> by this mm. almost surreal environment. What is that like the first day? 
almost surreal. It is surreal. Um, honestly, even before, uh, well, the first day for me was like of shooting was so much further down the line of uh, having these surreal moments, like costume fitting. I remember the first day just going in for my measurements and I walked in and there was racks of Starfleet uniforms and sketches and uh, oh my god (laughs) like forget it like and and getting to getting to try on my my red shirt that still had the pin like didn't have anything like it wasn't fitted but it had pins in it and it's just like as soon as that thing went on i'm like yeah. i'm i'm in heaven uh although it was a red shirt um, yeah so you know you're screwed. <laughs> you know, you're no, <laughs> please just i just want gold or blue <laughs> yeah, yeah even a white one sure um yeah. but uh yeah i mean all of the all of the the moments of um uh, of kind of proceeding across, like the, every day, it seemed like I was crossing another threshold into yeah, right. into the the next moment of, uh, I mean, all, all these like strange new worlds, exploration, and all that. But it really yeah. was, um, and there were just these touchstone moments of um, recognition. You know, getting to step onto the bridge and recognizing it's not exactly. I mean, it's it's the sort of. 2020 or 2021 version of that classic enterprise bridge but right. the little jelly bean buttons and getting yes. to hold the communicator or play yeah. with the transport a phaser all that or stuff. something oh. i've never got to pick up a phaser unfortunately oh, did, you, no? did you have a phaser in that show no, did you have a rifle no 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 oh, man. well well hammer is a pacifist so we wouldn't it's be true that's yes, true it wouldn't work that's right but i did get yeah. to pick up the little laser torch um in elysium kingdom yes. some of your Science. some of, some of your cohorts least favorite uh, episodes yeah i, like, I think it's, <laughs> mean there's yeah. me and one other co-host that we absolutely adore that episode because yeah, I feel like so it much fun arcs to play. back to some of the classic storytelling from the mm-hmm. from the original series. Can I ask you though, change yeah. the subject a little bit, sure. I'm fascinated with the makeup and that whole process because oh, yeah. like for you on a normal day, how early were you getting in that makeup chair? Were you like one of those guys on there at four o'clock? First yeah. one in, last one out, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, first one's in, last one's out for sure. Um, yeah. The the prosthetic process they the an initial screen test um that day took five and a half hours to get into oh. all of it um and they painted it and then repainted it and then they put me in front of the camera and that was really my first day on set in full costume full makeup um and I, you know i got into the costume and i walked onto the set and had my 10 minutes in front of the camera and and probably spent you know, nine minutes and 45 seconds crying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> tears of joy, friends. Tears of, of joy. Course, um, course, absolutely. Eventually, they got it down to three and a half hours. Um, so that would be four, because it would be three and a half hours, and then there would probably be a half hour buffer time in case they needed to do any touch ups or whatever. And then then the shooting day would start. So if I was called, or if the shooting day was at 9 a.m. to be on set, then it was four hours before that. Was that the first that. role that you <laughs> undertook with so much makeup? Was that the first thing you've been involved with with that much makeup? I would oh, so. yeah, for sure. I mean, so I know my, you're in Warehouse 13. Yeah, yeah but that was, uh, that was a, I think, a single day, and I was wearing a pair of glasses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, honestly, like my, my film and TV experience is extremely limited. I, my background is in theater. Yeah, so theater, we do want to get so, into that. Mm. I assume you're a theater kid. I'm a theater kid. So is Same. that how you started? Like high school? Uh, yeah, and stuff like yeah. That? My, like as I said, my dad was a high school English teacher, but he was also a drama teacher. I have ah. three old, older brothers, and we're all involved in the arts in some way. Um, yeah. So we were putting on plays and things. I think I, I wrote my first short film when I was in grade six. Oh, um, my did my first like real well real full-on play when i was in high school um but yeah it was uh it, it, something that i i was very passionate about I, initially i wanted to be a, a playwright and a writer um but i got bit by the acting bug pretty early on so mm. that's uh and and that's yeah, been your your drive throughout your career because like i said i'm fascinated mm. by actors i think we said before i mentioned i quickly mm. mentioned before the show is i've always 
why get into that? Like, you have to have <laughs> such a passion for acting because we know 95% of actors at all time are unemployed. That's the yep. general kind Definitely. of statistic that goes out there. So it takes a certain type of mindset, passion, uh, a lot of resilience to keep driving forward. Um, mm. You know, and, and I think it's... I've found when I've asked actors who continue to act that it's really hard for them to define why they still do it. It's just they can't help but do it. Is that <laughs> for you? Is there... Yeah, yeah. I've, um, I, you know, my my real passion is is creation. Is is continuing to to develop uh, in whatever whatever. Uh, um, it's not necessarily just about being an actor. I'm also a musician. I'm a composer. I'm a writer. I'm a director. I'm a painter, mm. um, a visual artist, or whatever. Mm. Uh, I just, I really enjoy creating things, and hopefully, um, people respond to them in, in, in ways that are positive. Um, so, for me, if I didn't didn't get on stage in a day or or in a year or whatever, I would still find a way to write songs, perform, you know, get up and do cabarets, uh, sing music or whatever it is. Uh, I I do enjoy entertaining people, and whether that's through uh, visual art or music or or performing on stage or whatever, it's um that's just kind of my drive. I was a you know, I'm a uh, self-admitted class clown. Um, and when I was in elementary school, it was just one of my favorite things to to get my classmates to laugh um, and distract them from getting an education. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's way um, to do it. <laughs> but I remember, I, I think my brother brought home a copy of George Carlin's Class Clown album. Um, I don't uh, know if you're familiar with yes, that, but yeah, when I was Love very George young, yeah. oh, when I was very young, I heard his his sort of take on on being a class clown, and and it was really like, yeah, I related to that. It's like, hey, yeah. dig me, you know, depriving others of their education and all that, <laughs> and um, being a storyteller, finding a creative way to tell a story. Um, you know, I've I've tried my hand at at stand up comedy, uh, improvisational comedy, oh. um, improv. Uh, I've got a pretty extensive background in that as well. So, and also self production. I mean, I've I've been very fortunate over my career to kind of tap into not only doing doing performing the work of others, but also having the opportunity to do my own work. And if I'm not I'm going to spend probably the majority of my career self-creating, self-producing my own stuff. Um, and it was something that I learned very early on is that most actors just kind of sit around and wait for the phone to ring because you're kind of at the mercy of yeah. writers, directors, producers, or whatever, because you're yeah. waiting for someone. And for me, it's like, well, if no one else is going to hire me, I'm going to write my own stuff and do my own work because, uh, A, I got to keep working. I got to keep getting up on stage and, and, and kind of have this drive to, to continually create stuff. But, um, but also there's, um, there's autonomy to that as well. Yeah. So you know, it's interesting uh, where, where, um, probably the same age, Bruce, I think you're a 74 lad, aren't you? Born yeah, 74? that's right. Yeah. 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 It's around the same age. Isn't it wonderful though? Now, I think from our time, like I went and studied film in the late eighties, which I was literally cutting film, you know, cutting, mm. gluing, yeah, yeah, yeah. doing all that. <laughs> so now yeah. to be able to outlet yourself so creatively in so many different ways and, being able to do it with modern day, I think that's what's great for content creators too because Truly. what I related yeah. to what you said, even though I do like videography as my normal job, I own my own business, mm -hmm. things like that, it's the same. It's the need to be creative as almost a release. Mm. It's like if I just sitting, I can't sit and do nothing. If you're not doing podcasting, I'm doing this corporate, I'm doing something creative. Yeah. Yeah. And it is that thing I think you find most people, including yourself, Joe. I'd, I'd continue in. You oh yeah, because I have a music podcast too, and I yeah, just yeah, church it. It's yeah. that thing, isn't it? And it's yeah. just wonderful yeah. that we now live in that world where digitally, just technology wise, you can express mm. yourself in so many different mediums. Yeah. Are it's you doing great. Anything? It's great. Are you doing anything in the internet space? Is that something you're looking into, like Currently? your own podcast or making well, films directly for streaming or something? Yeah, what I'm so about uh gosh now so it was april 1st 2011 i started painting 
uh, pretty seriously. A friend of mine asked me how I see, and so I decided to paint a portrait of them and to interpret my visual impairment through yeah. the medium of visual art. Um, and that's been going now. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm getting close to a thousand portraits. And wow. since the pandemic, wow. what I've done is because I, I, I kind of I used to insist that they would be live in person sittings because, yeah. you know, some, there's magic that happens when two people get in the room together. But when the pandemic struck, obviously, I couldn't do that. So I said, well, I'm going to try try doing this online over Zoom. And what I discovered is that um, the opportunity for capturing and creating a digital content was suddenly just kind of handed to me. So I record those sessions. I take screenshots of those sessions and I'll create digital portraiture that are, is accompanied with audio. So now instead of just a, well, now as well as an eight by 10 acrylic canvas, I can create a three and a half minute time-lapse video of that work being created with audio of the person being interviewed. So it goes from being just a sit sort of standalone interview to now you have a visual element, a creative visual element of it. So um, the last couple of years, I've been doing these online portrait sittings that I've been oh, editing into three and a half, four minute videos that where you can see um, not only the portrait itself visually being created, but also the interview that goes into and, the, and hear the person's voice. Because I find that oftentimes there's something quite evocative about not only the what somebody says, but the, the way that they say it. Um, that is that creates another element to uh, an actual portrait. No, that's I wonderful. You've got to bring that a... multi-dimensional aspect to it. I've actually got a photo yeah. here. I, I think it's is this your self-portrait here? That's right. Yeah. Person? So that's portrait number two hundred or three hundred. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's if... ten years old. <laughs> yeah. I, wow, I still man. look where like that a little find... bit. Yeah, it looked totally. Yeah. <laughs> where would we find you online? Where Where is mostly? Are you doing the stuff? Is it Instagram? Is it social media platform? Well, I've got a website, oh, Bruce Horak. Com, um, and uh, I post a lot of stuff up there. Uh, I'm also on Patreon um, at Bruce Horak, and I'm on Instagram, pretty active on Instagram. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> that's where we met. <laughs> face, Facebook, uh, Facebook. Um, I've got a page on Facebook. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've I'm, flirted around I'm with over it, 40. but I've realized I'm too, I don't get it. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> over 40 years. I'm there, but it's like, eh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, not my wheelhouse. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, quick question for you. The you, you said you were the practical joker in school. Now, did you bring any of that humor and light to kind of bond with your castmates on Strange in the World? You play a lot of jokes with them? Oh, you know, honestly, that that's. Oh gosh, that first season was just so strange because we were under these really intense COVID the pandemic shoot, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And and I remember like the uh, the season one rap gifts. There wasn't there wasn't even a, I don't think a season one rap party oh. because we were under all of these um, protocols. But all of the rap gifts had something to do with like. We made it. Look what we did. Oh my God. Consider the considering the conditions. Like we yeah. still managed to get this thing done. So there was such limited socializing and you know, between takes you kinda of have to go off into your trailer and hide away and oh, lunch was wow. always yeah. solitary. So it was yeah, it was unfortunate for that. I mean Obviously, when the cameras started rolling and once we kind of got on set, then it's like this eruption because we had it was like all these like penned up greyhounds who wanted to kind of hang out. It's like yeah. action. It's like, yeah, who are you? Like, let's hang out. <laughs> yeah. um, that so comes there across was, on screen. Uh, yeah, I think it really does. Yeah, and and really also, does. like, there was, there was such a there was such a joy to, you know, creating a new Star Trek and um, and so many fans that were working on it that uh yeah it just i think i i go back and i watch that first season and i'm like it just bleeds right through the screen of how much joy there was and, and love and and fun there yeah yeah you mentioned about the fans like have they been embracing and, and kind of crying every time they meet you because your character met that demise or are you just well i i'll tell you this i i did my my first well and and to this point only uh star trek convention in las vegas last summer oh um and uh the line it was so like i i 
you know, so <laughs> I went to one comic convention with my dad, like in the early eighties and it was in the basement of this old community hall and there were 10 tables and, you know, 60, 60 comic books getting passed around from one dude to another. And it's like, Oh, this is what a, this is what a convention is like. Yeah. And then I went to Vegas for whatever, what was it? The 56 year mission. And I was like, Whoa, you know, just kind of hair blown back at the size and scope of it. And this I kind of went out, to sit at my that table where I was signing autographs and before I even got there there was this line going across the yeah. hall and who's that for? Like where's and it was oh that's for me. And yeah. every single person that came up, you know, said, Well, we love you so much and we're so sorry that they killed you off. And and by about half an hour into it I kind of turned to the person sitting next to me and said, It's like I got to I got to attend my own funeral. <laughs> <laughs> this is really lovely. Like <laughs> they they all love me and they were sorry they were gone on and you know expressing their condolences and oh wow. um, that's and, actually and interesting it's really I'm lovely. Ask you this mm. you knew signing on that you only were going to be for one season um, they told me right yeah in that first mm. um the meeting with henry along the myers where he he talked about the character and he talked about the arc of it he said there yeah that was that was it he's like we're gonna we're gonna have this incredible bond with uhura he's gonna be kind of the crusty mentor and then we're gonna and then he's going to die. And he's like, I want you to know that straight up. And I said, okay, thank you. You know, thank you for telling me that. He said, we don't know exactly how it's going to happen. That's We're having a really happen. hard time writing it. Mm. <laughs> That's what he said. Like before that, before I was even, you know, had my first makeup test, he said, we're having a really hard time because we love this character. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know who drew the short straw to have to kill him off. I think it was Davy Perez, but um, oh. the week. So we were still shooting, uh, episode eight, which I think is Elysium Kingdom. Is yeah, that right? It is. Yep. Yeah. Episode. So we were shooting that when we read the script for episode nine mm. and, uh, I got, I got the script and, you know, it was, it was bittersweet. It was bitter in that, you know, I knew he had to go, but it, I, I was so thrilled with, it was a cool death. I just kept thinking that yeah. from the beginning when they told it's, me, it's like, please make it, please make it cool. Please make it cool. Don't, <laughs> don't let it be like, what's your button do? And yeah, yeah, he yeah, jacks yeah. himself or something <laughs> dumb. You know, I wanted yeah, yeah, it to yeah, be yeah. cool. You want that, that yeah. cool And it moment. is a and cool scene in that episode. Yeah. So I still love the episode, even though I said I had a couple of, could, you know, I thought, oh, a little bit derivative. But however, your scene, your death, and I remember talking about this on the show, Joe. You yeah, I remember. This, we weren't denied. It was very hard to watch because we formed such a bond with you that the almost like a childlike reaction was to deny that it actually happened. Yeah, we can. Like, yeah, you know, it's that discussion. Of, oh yeah. No, he's still alive. They're gonna. Right. They, you know, he's not dead. He's probably just frozen. He, they, right. And come Dorian's up. can survive. The, yeah, we didn't yeah. see the body land. Right. You no, don't see that was a big thing for <laughs> us. Yeah, 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 that we were like, really on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and uh, you know, even when we were shooting that episode, and I think there were even a few cast members who didn't know it was coming. Oh. Um, and I, I was very tight-lipped about it when we were shooting the earlier episodes. I didn't oh. say, oh, and did you know that I'm going to be biting it or whatever? I, like, really not saying anything about that. And, uh, the you know, in the hallways, people were kind of jamming on, like, okay, so what if? And I, <laughs> that's been part of the joy of the last Gosh, has it been almost a year since been that year, aired? Man. Yeah. Whoa. Um, but hearing the, the fan theory. theories, yeah, yeah. That's right. hearing the fan theories and the ideas about how to bring him back, what's going to happen next, I just love it. I mean, oh, it's, okay. it's it's so creative. It's so intriguing. And as a writer, um, I love... I love writing myself into a corner and then a creative way out of it, you know, and like coming up with that. It was like that, that season of Sherlock where the first episode and they all come in and, and all the, all the theorists and conspiracy theories like, yeah, but if this was happening, then that thing and all these really creative ideas about how a character is going to survive. I just think it's, it's so intriguing. And, you know, I've got my own ideas about, well, what about, okay, so he hatches a Gorn. So what if that Gorn is half Enar is now st like grows up and then struggles with its sort of pacifist nature, but it's wow. half Gorn. And so uh, like, <laughs> what would that be? And then like, it goes on to become like a member of Starfleet security. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, I, I have... write fan fiction in my head all the time. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but isn't that wonderful? Cause it's art inspiring art. 
And mm-hmm. to me, that's one of the greatest things. Even in our little podcast, we occasionally get people who will send us a drawing or something I've done. Mm. And it's my favourite thing in the world because Love it's it. not that I call this art, but it's creation, creating, inspiring More someone cre- to create. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What you've created. Yeah. It's, 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 really, it's really wonderful and seeing, yeah, like the fan art that has been coming out. Um, there's a fellow in uh, in Canada here uh, named Don Einerson who actually did a 3D model of Hammer and printed oh, it up. So I now have like a little Hammer action figure, which is, you know, awesome. as a kid growing up with Star Trek, I had a Captain Kirk action figure. Oh, so, oh no, you, you know, know, mate, they're, they're going to come out with that official Hammer figure. They thing. have to. Oh, they will. God, they will. Absolutely. Because there's millions of us that are ready to buy it. Like, yeah. Instantly. Yeah. Like, shut up and take my money. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Shut up and take my money. <laughs> hey, I, um, going back to what you said, how you didn't tell your cast, some of them didn't know. I love that choice because what a way to continue that chemistry when you're performing with someone because you're. The idea of you not telling your cast members means they're in shock when they read that script. Right. And they're used to having you there. And so their performance is driven by this chemistry that you're building together. And then to kind of take that away from them, I uh, I don't know. Maybe that's the sick part of my mind thinking Mm -hmm. here. Working with the team, like I said, you had really difficult working conditions. Um, Doesn't seem to be like any egos there. Not that you could tell if there was anyway but it genuinely seems new star trek is just filled with fans not only mm. the people behind the scenes but the guys you're getting on the screen yeah it's it's um if you finding that you're just surrounded by nerds when you were feeling <laughs> that like oh, i remember this episode and uh well you know, and I can't remember uh, specifically, but there were, yeah, there's a few cast members that were that were pretty deep into it, and lots of lots of folks on that that uh, cast who were quite new to the new to the the franchise as well. So it was, it's fun, and and certainly as someone who um, myself like kind of raised on it, there I I there was a, a window of time where like I didn't watch Deep Space Nine. Oh. Uh, when it was out and so i got to go back and discover it for the first time and i remember saying oh I, you know i finally like I, I cracked into season three i think the first two seasons of deep space nine i was like no nah, not entirely sold on it and then like dominion war starts happening yeah like, oh my god and the, this yeah. is incredible and there's that there's an episode is it in season three where where uh anyway like just nerding out <laughs> so as, as i'm doing right now um because recounting it but but so many folks who are like oh my god i wish i was in your position to see yes. that for the first time yeah. and then you're getting the episodes and, like in a pale moonlight and oh, as an actor you must be thinking oh my how amazing is this truly like just uh, and the gifts of those those great story arcs and uh, individual stories and and character journeys that you get in you get in science fiction and long running science fiction that's um yeah it's just got such history to it and and uh yeah i feel incredibly honored to be to be a part of it and then yeah i mean honestly star trek fans are the best and they're so welcoming and on like from the very first moment that it was announced on star trek day i think within 30 seconds of the announcement that i was a part of it and my my facebook messenger was blowing up with people oh, saying awesome. oh my god you're in star trek and then like total like strangers who well not not strangers to me because i had been a fan but just reaching out and saying welcome to the family and, oh, oh my nice. god this is the That's best amazing. this is the best and what yeah. about your family when you got to tell them i'm sure because <laughs> you explained earlier there must have been some real big excitement in the in the immediate family huge excitement um yeah from 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 my family um i remember my brother clayton who's a year just a year and a bit older than me and he's got uh and my niece uh alice and strange new worlds was her first star trek oh and clayton was saying oh this is so great like he got to sit down with alice and you know tell her about captain kirk and got to explain kind of the world of it and and there's uncle bruce on on screen it's like where oh (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. that's him that's him what three week bender or something you know (laughs) and yeah Yeah. yeah, he's got a tenor all of a sudden (laughs) yeah (laughs) he's had a rough night (laughs) with all the joy of strange new worlds 
there's an air of tragedy to the series, isn't there? That's ever looming. Oh, and I feel God, like yeah, your death yeah. is mm. a almost an indicator of what's to come. Like in things don't work out well, especially for the captain eventually. Yeah. And yeah, I get the feeling yeah. maybe a couple of other characters as they go through this series. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's interesting, isn't it? Is that something you feel that was in the writing that there's always that? I mean, they deal with it in the last episode of that season. They do. Um, and and I, I, I love that that episode of uh, Discovery where he sees his future, you know, where he goes and sees that that time. And then he's got to constantly make that decision of, am I going to stay here? Is this is this the thing? And that, and that um, yeah, I think that theme plays out really nicely over the first season. And um, I will say no further on it. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good narrative driver, isn't it? It is. It's you great. Have that, you know, yeah, it's like if, if you... If you really, if you know that this thing is going to, this is how it's going to go. I mean, right from the first moment that you see Pike on, on back on earth, he's at the farm, he's got the big beard and it's like, yeah. he's refusing to step back into it. And that's just such a, a classic sort of Joseph Campbell moment of the hero refusing to, to play anymore, but right. you get, you're going to, eventually he's got to get drawn back into it. And I think that's why he makes such a compelling character is yeah. that, you know, he's very much chosen this journey and he and he continually has to do it and that honestly that last episode of the first season i just thought wow like they have they've really knocked it out of the park with oh, did they I, well. because yeah, we truly. know we now know that at the end of that with all pikes insecurities and that he has come to a level of acceptance and it's so mm. important for his character to tie that up because it's a launching point now into season two. We can move into other areas of his emotional journey and his you know, mm -hmm. physical journey throughout the series. It's just, it's, um, I'm stunned to be honest. So I was a little bit nervous about Strange New Worlds, but I'm stunned at the quality. I was stunned at the, obviously, uh, Discovery scale, the Hollywood film yeah. scale now that is happening. And Strange New Worlds takes that and then, infuses this retro style to it and this for me episodic television oh mm. i was so thrilled <laughs> to go back to that which each episode even though there's an overall arc a beginning middle and end yeah and yeah. as an old school fan an old trek fan love that that format that i've decided to move with for strange new worlds one of the things you had mentioned was watching deep space nine one of my favorite actors on that show was uh jeffrey gomes who was in the reanimator and uh, he played multiple roles in oh, throughout the, the arc mm -hmm. of the season. So I'm wondering, um, would you come back and play another character? And would you prefer oh. less prosthetics next time? <laughs> 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 you could actually see you emote. <laughs> uh, uh, yes to both. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Uh, I mean, what I can legally say is that the Star Trek Ooh. career of Bruce Orak is not over. Oh, um, yeah. That, that, that was, the, that was the line that was sent to me in the email. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, but I do have to say, like, my, my background in, in theater and improvisation, um, there's a lot of mask work and there's, there's a lot of. Mm. Um, I, I really enjoy that. I love getting into prosthetics and kind of disappearing into the physically into a character. Um, and uh, yeah, the honestly, the prosthetic work in on Hammer is is pretty remarkable. Like, there's a fair amount of movement under all the. I mean, there's 15 different pieces of, of yeah. uh, silicon. I want to say latex, but it's silicon, yeah. and so it's, it's much latex. lighter and it and and thinner. And so yeah, like you, I could actually move my eyebrows, um, and uh, and all the pieces in there. So it's yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. And and I I honestly I love disappearing in that and and being unrecognizable because. I can then walk around a convention hall and nobody knows where. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll say kudos to you because with all those prosthetics, mm. you are emoting, like facial emoting, even when you weren't saying anything. I I was able to read where you were at, mm. and that must be a difficult thing because you are you're plastered with all this you said, silicon. You got a head cap on. You've been painted seven <laughs> ways to Sunday. So yeah, to actually yeah. still give a an emote performance is. 
do you overact in those scenarios? Are you forced to kind of make your expressions bigger because of prosthetics like that? I didn't feel that at all, actually. Mm. I felt like I could be quite natural under there. I mean, that's the thing with the, and, and part of the difference with doing camera work uh, to theater work is that with camera, everything is so small. And most of the, most of the, like, like the really, really top end uh, film actors say like, less, 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 less. You're always being told to do less with your face, less, more behind the eyes or whatever. And uh Thankfully, with the um, with uh, Strange New Worlds, all the if you look at my eyes and that, those aren't contact lenses; those are all digital alterations of my own. I'm gonna eyes. ask you about that because yeah, of, yeah, yeah. obviously there's so, complexity there. They did all the acting for me. I just had to show up and move the plastic around. <laughs> Actually, if you don't, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable asking the question, but you've been what? very open about it. Mm -hmm. um, how did you scripts? Because you've got a vision impairment. Like mm. the obvious thing is you read the scripts. How were you doing that? Were they delivered in audio format for you? Were no, they... I um. So they email the script out, and uh, I use my iPad, and I'm able. I I import it into a program called uh, Notability, which I'm just able then to blow the text up onto the screen. Oh, wonderful! Oh, and for mem I mean, I have a few tricks for memorization. Um, part of it is I'll I'll read it into an audio, so I'll read it off the page, and I'll read my lines, and I'll read the other person's lines, and. I just keep reading it, but yeah, I'm able to blow the, the font up and I'm able to invert it. So instead of it being uh, black text on a white background, I then have white text on a black background and much larger uh, font. But um, yeah, so I'm I'm able. I have enough vision that I'm able to read uh, large print. Mm -hmm. What about when you were like hitting marks and things like that? I'm, and, uh, well, forgive that's, me for uh, being rude. I'm just not at all. I'm no, I mean these are all. these are all. Uh, valid questions because i mean i certainly feel like um someone with a disability of, of my type being on a film and tv set is pretty rare but i'll say that um, inspirational too they For were them. when they put the casting call out they were looking specifically for blind and vision impaired actors that was in the, the breakdown, which is why my agent kind of flagged it and said, you know, are you interested in auditioning for this? And I said, absolutely. Um, Cause they're, they're, it's pretty rare that that yeah. specific kind of call yeah. came out and then it was Star Trek. Plus it was a brand new Star Trek and it was an Enar and you know, I'd, I'd seen Enterprise. So I knew that these characters existed. So I got very excited about that. And from the very beginning, the conversation was uh, from their end was what can we do to make you comfortable on set so i had an assistant with me from the moment that i arrived in the day they had a production mm. assistant who and and also because um i'm unable to wear those those contact lenses that sort of black out or blue blew out or white out my eyes so this i'm i'm and not able to wear a contact lens during the day i'm wearing one now and normally i would wear very heavy bifocal glasses but in the prosthetics because i've got prosthetics on my hands i got makeup on my hands and on my face and everything so i was having to spend the whole day without my glasses without my any sort of so i'm effectively rendered myself blind so uh things like a mark on the floor i'm not going to see mm -hmm. so they had an assistant who was there to help me find those marks the camera crew was incredibly helpful of like okay here's where your eye line is and and they would you know get somebody to stand there so i physically was able to you know visualize that i would count my steps there was an assistant who would count the steps with me it's like okay so it's four steps and then you turn right here and that's where you're going to hit your mark so um and just like from the start of the day to the very end of the day they they took incredible care of me uh mm -hmm. to the point where you know in, in a lot of cases in my own life where you know, I was told this as a as a young visually impaired person. They said, you know, I was told it's a sighted world. It's up to you to figure out how to fit in. You're the one that's that the world isn't going to change for you. You got to figure out your own way through this. And so I would come up with tricks. If I wanted to cross the street, for instance, I couldn't see across the street to see the signal, but there happens to be one right behind me. So I, if I'm going to cross the street, I'm turning around, looking at the one at the, at the street side behind me oh, to see what it changes. Yeah. And then I turn and kind of dash across or whatever. I'm listening for traffic or whatever, because I'm having to adapt for the very sighted world or carrying a white cane is another adaptation that I have to do in order to, uh, in order to adapt and then on the set of strange new worlds suddenly everyone else was there to go what can we do how can we help 
um, do you need an arm here? Do you, it, it's dark in this hallway. Is there some, you know, the step up, there's cables and people kind of really looking out for me. And so suddenly I felt like the pressure of me having to figure out uh, what I can do to fit into this world was taken off me. So all I had to do was show up and, and be the best hammer oh, I could sounds be. sounds like a gift. Yeah, that is awesome. It really was. And, you know, in, in some ways it, it kind of spoiled me for the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, next Star time, Trek. Now, next time <laughs> talk to your agent, you go, now, I expect this, this, this. Yeah, this, yeah. This, yeah. Blue gum and hams, you know. Yeah, Seriously, yeah. though, when mm -hmm. your agent calls, me and go, agent calls you and goes, hey, look, they're looking to cast Star Trek, my response would have been far more expletive filled with excitement. <laughs> Are you epic serious? Of course yeah. I want to be on Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, until I until I stepped onto the bridge in the full makeup and costume to do my first test, I I really thought that it wasn't happening. Yeah. <laughs> like even when even when they I think that the day I I it kind of started to sink in was the day that they tried uh, the contact lenses. So we had a day where I, I went with this, the contact lens specialist and we went to an eye doctor and um, they were trying on these opaque lenses. And the first thing that they did was to say, okay, you know, the doctor kind of checked me out and said, so what's your history? I said, well, here's what it is. And I kind of gave him the whole rundown of how I'd had retinoblastoma and I'd lost one eye when I was 18 months old. And then I'd had a cataract when I was four and a half and I wear these lenses and et cetera, et cetera. And he's just kind of nodding and just, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And kind of check my eye out. And, and then he's like, okay, so on the day, if you're showing up for a day of work, here's what's going to happen. This person is going to put a lens in your eye. You'll wear it for the mo longest you can wear one of these lenses. Cause they're really, opaque and thick and all that is like yeah. half an hour and then they have to take them out so we're going to try one and this assistant came over and i don't know if you've ever had somebody else put a contact lens in your eye oh, it's no. it's really shocking so they <laughs> put the thing in and yeah. it was opaque and i couldn't see anything or no the first one they tried had like a little hole where the um uh, not the iris the pupil was mm -hmm. but my pupil is actually offset slightly because of the damage that i've had so i couldn't even see out of the, the one that i was supposed to be able to see out of and i kind of looked and i and <clears throat> was like okay okay and i was kind of calming myself down because i was rendered effectively blind by this and then the assistant came over to take the thing out which was even worse and, uh, you know, my eye immediately went bright red and the doctor kind of and the the assistant and the and one of the producers left the room and the doctor kind of sat with me for a minute. And he's like, OK, so uh, you're already dealing with extremely limited eyesight. And what they're asking for is that we limit that even further. And effectively, these lenses could damage the very limited eyesight that you have. He's like, I'm going to suggest that this is not a good idea. And the producer came in and said, just so you know, you are not going to lose this job over a contact lens. We will find another way. We can fix wow. it in post. We will, we, awesome. We've got artists that will go in like screen by screen and digitally alter the eyes if we have to. And at that point, I went, oh, I guess that this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that's, that's a great story isn't it because it also shows again you're reinforcing that the studio was very respectful and um you know, understanding of the situation wanted to go out of their way to ensure that you know you were being looked after it's that's yeah. a great story for Paramount. So well done, yeah. Paramount. Well done, Paramount. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Looking hey, after so, your actors. Yeah. So yeah. your advocacy work for disabled yeah. actors is something that I wanted to ask you about because my my grandmother was a German immigrant that came during World War II and she lost her eye early as well. Uh, she was in an internment camp, and one of the things that was very difficult, very different world because she's much older. <laughs> But um, what are some of the things that you're doing for advocacy currently? Because uh, it's an inspiration and uh, she wasn't around to see your performance, but my mother was. And it meant a lot for her, who's now disabled herself, mm -hmm. to know that uh, this, is, this opportunity is available for young actors. Well, I think um, first and foremost, it's continuing to to practice and to find opportunities for myself to get out and, and to keep being like just living my life as a creative, as an artist. I think um, 
that's probably the strongest thing I can do for other potential creatives out there. Um, mm, I whether agree. or not they, they are uh, physically disabled or mentally disabled or in whatever capacity, even just artistically blocked. <laughs> um, uh, I think that just simply getting up every day and, and getting over the hurdle of uh, self um self whatever it is uh i was going to say Im immolation which is setting yourself on fire but um get, getting past those blocks is so important for any creative and i find inspiration in in just seeing what other people are producing and then you go deeper into the story of a how they do it why they do it and what hurdles they might have to overcome to do that for myself um visual impairment is just one of the myriad of humor of hurdles that i have to get over every day um whether it's uh having to pay bills is another hurdle um yeah. but uh advocacy for other disabled people mean to, to me means um supporting other artists and and to say you can do this and not only are can you do it but you should do this you should keep creating yeah. um and that I think is really important. Um, currently, uh, I have a, a bit of a campaign going to raise money for um, guide dogs for seeing for service animals for blind and vision impaired people. Um, I have a show called Assassinating Thompson, where it's a solo piece of theater where I paint a portrait of the entire audience while wow. I tell the story of how I became a visually impaired artist and I wow, solve the mystery. Crazy of that's who beautiful. killed Tom Thompson. And Tom Thompson was a Canadian painter who died mysteriously in 1917. At the end of the play of the show, I turn the painting around and I show the audience what I've created. And then we auction the painting off, or I auction the painting off to the highest bidder. And the proceeds from that uh, get donated to Canadian guide dogs for the blind. Oh, that's and so I myself do not have a service animal, but <laughs> I know that for a lot of people who are blind or vision impaired or low vision that the world starts to get smaller and smaller as you lose your mm. eyesight and and there's less of um confidence to go back out into the world to create a life for yourself and i, I use that term very broadly creatively um and service animals are a great way to uh, not only provide companionship, but also to help people get back out in the world and help them, them to create their lives. So well, to me, that's a, that's a really important part of it. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing from you, Bruce, which I find super inspirational and a message to everyone out there, it's about the power of resilience, isn't it? Your emotion, mm -hmm. your own developing your own resilience to whatever hurdles that come in life, whatever Absolutely. things that are stop it, you feel that may stop you in a pathway, a lot of it's in your own head. If you apply yourself, if it's something you're passionate about, you keep yeah. moving forward every day. Well, I had a mentor. I had a mentor very early. I mean, I, I have been very forced, uh, fortunate, very forced, very fortunate <laughs> to, uh, to have been blessed with a number of incredible mentors. And I had one mentor very early on who said, um, you're going to find in your life that what you see as your biggest weakness is actually your greatest strength. Mm -hmm. And it's, it struck me in my painting practice because I saw, well, I actually stopped in high school. I stopped painting and drawing uh, and really took up being a performer. Uh, I, I stopped painting and drawing because I couldn't. I couldn't paint or draw like fully sighted people. And I thought, oh, this is my weakness. Is like I paint like a blind man. And then years later, that became. I mean, it really became a not a secondary career, but a a, a, a parallel career for me of painting and exploring painting and expressing my visual impairment in that way. And people suddenly found that as a, as a, uh, they found it intriguing or they found it inspiring because there I was taking what I thought was a weakness and actually exploring it. And now it became a strength. And I think that um, in like resilience is one thing, but perspective seemed to me seems to help with that. And oftentimes just by flipping something around and lo and looking at the same thing from another point of view, suddenly it opens it up. And what I thought was this weakness was like a great strength. And what I thought was going to hold me back is actually set me free in a lot of ways. And especially in, with, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry I was going to say, especially with that, you're not actually bound by the rules of vision, are you? 
when you said that's your great <laughs> like strength that. because yeah. we're all stuck with seeing what we see, but you're not shackled with that. So, no. yeah, it's very fresh from an artistic's point of view, isn't it? Because mm-hmm. you are looking at it some way that only uniquely you, because every disability with eyesight is different for everybody. So, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That is a pretty great strength. It was a smart man who said that. <laughs> yeah. that hey, was Vince Bruni. I got to give him credit. Vince Bruni. Bruni. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Vince. Thanks, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I noticed you're into comics, and yes, your dad took yes. you to comic book conventions. And one of the yes. things that I've noticed about your character and you uh, right from the onset is your voice. It's very distinctive hmm. and it's very powerful. So Thanks. I'm wondering, you know, the kid in me, I'm a huge animated series fan. And I'm wondering, would you ever consider to do? Yes. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. no, Were you I going to ask if I would deep. do voice work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I get that all the deep. time. Yeah. I've got yeah, a face for radio. They say. Too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, and all that's been a dream of mine. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to read out loud. Um, Audio books is something I would just. Yeah, I'd love to do. I, I got the opportunity last year to voice. Um, it hasn't come out yet. There's a accessible uh, Wizard of Oz that was just recorded. Uh, mm-hmm. Accessible Audiobooks is a company out of somewhere in the United States, I think. And so they, they reached out to me and asked if I would participate in it. All of the performers are blind or low vision and everyone behind the scenes working on it. It's it's still trying to, uh, maybe we can get the word out through the podcast here. Uh, Absolutely. To, there's a Kickstarter, there's a, I think a GoFundMe campaign to get funds together too. Right. To have we'll have released. all those details Great. on the screen for you guys. Uh, Wizard of Oz, uh, and I got, to, play? I got to play the Scarecrow. Oh, <laughs> which I had done in a lie. I did it on stage <laughs> in, in my hometown of Calgary, Alberta, and you know, got to sing and dance and play the scarecrow based more on the uh, uh, the sort of movie version of it. But in the audio book, we were basically given free reign. So I ended up doing sort of a Sam Elliott impression, which was <laughs> maybe maybe an odd choice for the scarecrow. But I thought, That's well, fun. you know, he's he's sort of stuffed with straw and he's wearing a big old hat anyway. So yeah. might as well. It um, sounds like, yeah, from a, yeah <laughs> that works. I reckon that works. Sure, why well. not? Yeah. <laughs> At least it wasn't Return to Oz, which is Joe's favorite film. I love Return to like, Oz. I'm sorry. I'll me die too. On oh, no way. Oh, we become it's it's a crap out of me, that film. <laughs> it's, It is terrifying, but honestly, it's closer because I was, again, being raised on my dad's collection, he, he had uh, – all of the original L. Frank Baum books. I think there's 12 oh, in the series yeah. in hardcover first editions, and I I was raised on those, and I love them. The uh, the uh, John R. Neal illustrations from those books are closer to Return to Oz than what yes. they ended up being. Anyway, I could nerd out on Oz forever because I was huge. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in <laughs> not too far from where the sort of the Yellow Brick Road and area it wasn't oh. too far from me, so I've seen it. It's I wish they would repair it, but it's. It's one of my favorite things. And once I knew that after seeing Return of Oz, it's like, Mom, take me. So, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, I really in, enjoy your voice. And I feel like Thank you you. Know, it would be incredible for you to do like a Batman or, or yeah. You know, so many iterations <laughs> coming out. And even, you, even you the You mentioned series. comic books, Joe. We got to ask him though. Mm. Give us your top three, Bruce. Yeah. Come on, your top three comics. What are the, what are the go tos? <sighs> Okay, it's a hard well, can question, I, I know. Can I tell you a very sad story? Oh, <laughs> please do. <laughs> a little bit. Well, yeah, I mean, and you can edit this out. But so my my father passed away in 2003. And oh. before he passed away, he so he was diagnosed in August of 2002 with terminal cancer. And the last year of his life, he spent packing up his comic collection and selling it off. Oh. And uh, in that last year, he said to the four boys at, at varying points who we went down, back to Calgary to visit him, and I was very close, and, and he said, go down to the study, and he gave me like a stack of little sticky notes. He said, you put them on the comics that you want. Um, so I went down to the study, and I was, whatever, 28 at the time. And I didn't go down there thinking about monetary value. I went down and purely put sticky notes on the ones that I remember reading or having any sort of emotional attachment to. So after he passed away, there was a stack of comic books left for me. Not many, but enough. And then a year ago, uh, my house was robbed and they took all of my dad's comics. 
Oh, no. uh, heartbreaking. And I, and you know, friends were like, Oh, well, what did you have? And you know, for the insurance guy, it's just like make a list of them. And as I was listing them out, it's just more tears were coming. And I'm like, honestly, uh, if I saw them again, sure, I could buy those comics, but it was really the more the emotional attachment, the memory right. of, of yeah. sitting in my dad's study on yeah. the floor, reading them, um, you know, top three comics of all like that, that if I was to see them again, uh, the, the ones that I desperately would love to have back are going to be like the alpha flight series. Oh, yeah. It was Canadian superheroes. Yes, Canadian superheroes. <laughs> Actually, I was just talking about this with a friend of mine last week. She's like, "Oh, if you were to call, because I was in Calgary and the the Fan Expo was happening, and I kind of popped by just to see what it was all about." And uh, she was like, "So if you if you had your cosplay, who would you dress up as?" I'm like, "Oh, are you kidding? I'd be I'd be Vindicator. I'd be Guardian from Alpha <laughs> Either that or Puck, because I'm I'm her suit." Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know the the Frank Miller Daredevil. For oh, sure, yeah. uh, there was a series called Camelot Three Thousand, <laughs> which was uh, where drawn by. But I don't know, yeah, what that was about. I'm aware. Brian of Boland was the artist, and he oh, did. Right. Uh, he drew Killing Joke, Batman Killing Joke, Oof, um, which is just a fantastic artist. But Camelot Three Thousand yeah. was a limited edition where uh, King Arthur comes back. Ah, oh, cool. <laughs> I mean, you 3, got 000. me straight away because you're talking, <laughs> and you got Joe in chat. I know Joe's big. Camelot medieval fan. Oh yeah, I, so I we're in. Yeah, I'm in deep. <laughs> yeah, um, but the classics illustrated series. Um, that was a series that, like, my my dad was an English teacher, so he loved classics illustrated. The first time I ever read Shakespeare was was a uh, classics illustrated Hamlet, I think. Um, oh. But yeah, like in terms of uh, like Daredevil for sure, because you know. It's <laughs> the blind superhero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah of course, of course. And uh, right. Batman for sure. Um, yeah, yeah I, I can't just do three. Are you kidding? No. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's a tough question. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. Although I'm it's... currently digging the uh, the Strange New Worlds comic book because you know Hammer's got a panel in the first issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, honestly, yeah. like that is yeah. Sure, being being on the television series is one thing, but seeing you like my character yeah. in a comic book. Again. I'm just tickled <laughs> at the thought that some young Star Trek fans walk into a comic shop and there's. Bruce Horak picking up and his, his <laughs> yeah. current comic of Strange New Worlds. Yeah, that's oh, a yeah. Real, yeah. mind blowing oh. moment for some I'm, youngster out there. I'm just thrilled. I'm just thrilled. Yeah. Are you getting people approaching you at this point? You must be like people, or is it because of the makeup? They just have no idea. They have no idea. Well, I'll tell you this um, you know, speaking of moments where I felt my life changing, um, first of all, when, when, uh, you know, and I walked onto the bridge. And then when I saw, before the series aired, they sent the cast screening um, episodes to see it. And I got the uh, episode one. You know, I knew that Hammer was in, I think, uh, even in the shootings, I was in five of the ten episodes. So I thought, oh, you know, I'll be, my name will be in the end credits, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. And then on the first episode, my name shows up as the, the nacelle lights up and there's my name and there's just like mm. tears. Oh. And then they, they added that shot of in the first episode where I beam on. That wasn't in the, the shooting script. That was oh. that was actually the very last thing I shot. You know, oh, we were wow. having a day and they're like, Bruce, we need you in the transporter room. It's like, yeah, maybe we're going to add a thing where Hammer beams in at the end of the first episode. Oh, we don't oh. know. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay. And then there is that shot and I'm watching the whole episode. I see my name in the credits. I'm like, what? I'm not in this episode. I'm not in this episode. And then <laughs> there he beams on with his jacket over it's, his shoulder. It's yeah. like super cool. And I'm it's like, a good what? moment because <laughs> who is doing the voiceover explaining yeah. Like, yeah. her place and you know, yeah. the adventure that there's that Hammer. Begin. So introducing you to be part of that, too, yeah. it's actually quite So they invited thing. me, they invited me to New York for the premiere. Oh. And uh, I was like, well, okay, this is wild. Like, what am I doing in the, you know, because there's, there's the top eight on the call sheet and Hammer is like number 14. So why am I going to the, to the trailer or to the premiere in New York? And, and uh, flew down to New York and just, you know, like all this sort of, well, no fanfare, really, just kind of went to the hotel and kind of hung out. And like the next morning, the premiere was happening and I left the hotel to go for a walk around the block. 
And there was this crowd of people and they're like, Bruce, 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 shouting for me. I'm like, uh, what? And they're like, and they had, they had printed up posters and they were looking for autographs and I'm standing on the corner. And I said to the, the guy, I'm like, I'm, you're my very first autograph ever. <laughs> like, how did you recognize me? We're so excited about it. We're going to the premiere and they're telling all the, you know, their, their fan stories. And like, I have stepped into a whole other realm of being I here. Never underestimate Star Trek fans to yeah. do their research because they, they do. Will. Wow. <laughs> and they recognize me without any of the makeup. They wow. knew who I was, and yeah. So, w within uh, a certain subsect of uh, of the species, I am recognized. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. <laughs> but I I went to uh, I did I had, when I was in Calgary last weekend. There was the fan expo, and I went as a fan. I just wanted to go and check it out and see what was happening. And there was a Star Trek cosplayer red carpet photo opportunity happening and i kind of walked by to see what the costumes were like and there was one person who's like can i get a photo with you and they knew who i was Jeez. they didn't make a big deal of it like no, at that's all a, you know i was kind of in disguise that? not being in but yeah super you thrilling imagine that joe like <laughs> nobody else is recognizing bruce Hort, but you're the guy that gets the yeah. photo. wouldn't oh, that be like okay stay quiet, just, just yeah away. you, you like, get the butterflies in your stomach you're like, yeah yeah like, right, i've got right. the one thing everyone else is it's yeah, so, yeah. I, it's I right in front of them and they can't see it what yeah. A <laughs> yeah yeah oh my goodness so um you're going to be in trek long island at the end mm. of this month mm. yes sir and so mm -hmm. will i so oh. I'm looking forward to taking a photo with you and giving you <laughs> illustrious Captain Quadrant shirts. Fantastic. We'll give you some of our merchandise for sure. I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So if you don't um, mind. <laughs> am I wearing? I'm not even. I'm probably wearing a Star Trek shirt under this. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah you this are. Is, yeah. <laughs> this is from. This was season one. This is from the stunt department. Oh, nice. Cool. And you wouldn't know it, but I actually had a day of stunts on on episode one because there was a shot uh, that made it to the cutting room floor, but when Hammer jumps off the back of the ship there was a stunt where i fall into the cavern which mm. got cut so that that shot was done with me in a harness and they flew me up into like two and a half stories into the ceiling oh, which required cool. stunts so i got to do some wire work and as a result i got a stunts t-shirt although it never made it into the show but um, so on the day of shooting <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, it was great. Wearing that harness and your voice is still low. I'm surprised. Yeah. Those harnesses. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, guys, get their we voice the raised a little bit. Question. Well, I, it's been two years, so I've healed. <laughs> 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 Thank uh, you so much for your time today. Yeah, absolutely. It's been an absolutely wonderful chat. Um, Cheers, yeah. Thank getting you. Getting to talk to you. It's just. Thanks, uh, for, uh, thanks for staying awake for this, eh? Yeah. Oh no! Nah, I, I look. I'm oh, you set your alarm now. I had dinner at four o'clock. I'm asleep by seven o'clock. So it was all oh, great. I'm yeah, an early good. person. There's no way I wasn't going to get a chance to talk to literally a character, well, an actor who played my favorite character from straight. And I don't say that just because I'm here. I have evidence and uh, yeah, yeah. Cooper, we have episodes. I, I, like, I was making love work. clips about yeah, not not creepy. Just going yeah, you yeah, know, just. In awe of a character that he just brought dimensionality to a series that was different for me, you know. Mm. And I, I appreciate that. You know, Thank and you. I'll be really honest with you, Bruce. I don't know if this is, and I hope it's you take it as a compliment. I seriously don't didn't know you were blind, you as a human being, until about episode seven when I started to research. I hadn't done any pre research about it, so yeah, I knew right. the character was blind, but I had no idea as an actor that that you were. So. I look at that as just going, well, great writing, great performance, because I'm just focused on the character. Even the character, I don't think we ever really think of him. We know he's got vision impairment, but it's such mm -hmm. a small part of him. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know what I mean? Like, there's so much yeah. more to Hammer. True. So um, thank you again so much. I know <laughs> me pleasure. and Joe, we're really looking forward to this. But the most exciting thing is that little email that you said to us that Bruce Horak and Star Trek isn't over. And... Uh, that's fantastic to hear. Yeah. Well, stay tuned. Him is over, but Bruce, Bruce, Bruce lives. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bruce. It is Star Trek, um, but anything's possible, eh? I mean, if you yeah. can have well, a this was what, captain come back. So. Well, this was when, when I was in Vegas and uh, – I mean, I had my fanboy moments, just like turning around every corner, and there was Jonathan Frakes, 
Oh. And uh, he came over and he was so effusive and so kind. And he said, oh. you know, it's sci-fi. Anything can happen. Nobody's really dead in sci-fi. <laughs> oh, nice. I was like, Thank give me a hug, sir. And then, you know, that, <laughs> yeah, because he's like mountain. nine tall or something like that, right? He, yeah. yeah, I think he's like 9-1 or something. 9-1, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of season three of Picard? Did you, have you watch it? Oh. I love oh it. Oh, my God, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm like, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, and like, that shot of them around the table playing poker is just like oh. so delicious. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just so well. Done. It really was. Uh, there were so many moments in that third season that, um, yeah, I mean, it was kind of a cheer cry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. It was, you know. Yeah. And they brought in new elements. So I really liked uh, that actor Ed Spieler oh, by Jack Crush. I thought great, nailed great it. Yeah, yeah. It and then you've the got beginning. Amanda Plummer as well. Oh yeah, she was. <gasps> Yeah. Playing yeah. Vatic, she was delicious as that as well. You know, yeah. no, nah, yeah. very cool, great show. Oh, and I, I love that that this all the stuff between Riker and Worf and well, yeah. yeah. Oh, anyway, I will move it through yourself. You I love this one. <laughs> Hello, I'm one here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you know what? I, I'm I'm so happy that I mean, I think to me, like, kill Data off every every season because <laughs> it, honestly, because it, when he comes back, it's just so a thrill and and yeah. i know that, that they sort of take flack for like oh yeah he's died three times or whatever but i'm i'm so happy with that character because um, every incarnation of him just sort of goes deeper and deeper i, I re-watched next generation and i watched the movies afterwards and i yeah. sort of saw this incredible i mean from the first moment where Riker says nice to meet you pinocchio and then you actually right. see the pinocchio arc where right. he sacrifices himself in what is that episode yeah. or movie 10 or whatever. Yeah, they, um, yeah, and, and just yeah. beautiful like tie in there. And then they bring him back in Picard season yeah. one. And I, anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled. And plus, no, it's a I'm a huge Brent of... Spiner fan. So oh, okay. just bring him back. And I'm, I'm so happy that, that, uh, that, that season exists. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think everybody yeah. is the mm -hmm. entire, like Terry Metalis just gave the Star Trek fans. Nailed it. Yeah, yeah and nailed it. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the fact that he'd be very smart to be out there in social media going, hey, you know, I'd like to do more Star Trek Legacy, anyone? And we're like, anyone? yes, mm -hmm. please mm -hmm. make yeah. that happen now. Um, yeah, exactly. yeah. Maybe, yeah, we could bring back, it's been a few hundred years later, but they could land on that planet and revive Hammer. Technology. Sure, yeah. yeah. Frozen, <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. They could I'm find cool. Hammer's kid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I play a, I play a mean half Gorn, half Enar. There you go. <laughs> By the way, I love what they did with the Gore too. The Gorn turning yeah, into this cool. unstoppable, ferocious Ooh. species oh, that yeah. that are probably the biggest threat in that series at the moment. We're good, we're good. But yeah, very cool. But we should tie it up, shouldn't we, Joe? I'm yes, sure yes. Bruce has a life he'd like to go. And yeah, do. I know he wants to do stuff with himself. I could talk Trek all day. Oh, <laughs> well, well, we would love to have you one day come on and do an Agony Booth episode where we get on and revisit old Trek episodes. And Great. it's done in a loving way. We don't hate yeah, we all don't. things. We, right. we poke lovingly holes in it, you know, and, and enjoy mm -hmm. the the cheesiness of whatever episode we're watching. So if you're ever free one day, and I'm sure you're not because you're busy, <laughs> but, but if you ever are, we'd love to have you on. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I'm Joe Dove, captain of the Spectrum Sanctorum, this wonderful podcast channel. We have so many other shows. Thank you once again, Bruce. Thanks, Bye, VHS Chase, for joining us. But Bruce, man. And all Bruce's is... details will be in the description yes. as well as on the screen right now. Yes, right absolutely. <laughs> Make sure Thanks, you visit all of these places. Support, support, support. Check out SpectrumSanctorum.net for all of our podcast merch. We have an entire merch store ready to give you all the things that you loved about our podcast. And get notified on all of our socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and our Spectrum Sanctorum merch store. Follow us today and be sure to hit that bell when you're watching our YouTube videos so you can be notified of when a new episode releases.